Hello, and welcome to the BMC webinar featuring Forrester, entitled Overcoming SecOps Hurdles Decreases Risk While Increasing DevOps Efficiency. I'm Sean Jakes, Director of Solution Marketing for BMC Security Compliance and Automation, and I'm joined by Amy DeMartin, who's a Principal Analyst at Forrester. Before we get started, I want to give you a little headlights into a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we will have a question and answer session at the end. You can start by entering questions at any time into the chat. And secondly, if you want to download the presentation, you can do that by going under the event resources area and underneath ask a question, there should be a place where you can uh, download the presentation. So this, this project uh, around SecOps, we started off uh, a couple of years ago thinking about security and operations and the, the the, the gap that's been identified between these security teams and the IT operations teams has, has been a source of, of potential places where security may not be as effective, effective as possible. And so we wanted to conduct this research and we asked Forrester to, to help us out in finding you know, what, it, what are the things that customers are most concerned about, what are the benefits they're expecting to gain, and, and how far along are they on this, this journey in connecting the security and the operations teams um, in, in making them more, more efficient. And that's some of the findings that you're going to find from, from Amy. So we're really excited to have Amy DeMartin. So I mentioned Amy is a, is a Forrester analyst. She's been with Forrester for a while. She focuses on risk and security and um, <clears throat> is helping companies to transform their software and application security practices. She has been focused on um, DevOps in the past and has a tremendous background of experience. She also has a uh, master's degree in telecommunications from, from the University of Colorado as well as a bachelor in computer and engineering. A uh, little fun fact, my wife also has a degree from the University of Colorado. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Amy DeMartin, who's going to take you through the first little thing, and then I'll come back and talk, you, talk to you about a couple of solutions that we have from BMC Software. So, Amy? Excellent. Thanks, Sean. Go boss. That's great. <laughs> so, like Sean said, we're going to be talking about how to overcome SecOps hurdles and to decrease risk while also increasing DevOps efficiency. So we at Forrester believe in this zero trust when it comes to security. And in previous lives of security, it used to be that if you built your wall high enough or your moat deep enough, you would be able to defend your applications. Well, no longer is that the case. And so we really advocate zero trust in that you have to build layer upon layer of security. That it's not good enough just to build your moat wide enough or your walls high enough. That if you don't also then put barriers around your applications, if you have vulnerabilities as part of your application stack or the application itself, for example, that lets attackers in. And then once they get into the, the application itself, if you don't have barriers around your data, encryption, for example, in transit and in rest, then that's another way for attackers to get in. So in this perfect world, it would look a little like this with the layers upon layers and your applications would sit in the middle, your data would sit even farther in, and there'd be separate walls around everything. Unfortunately, what we see is this perimeter really falling away. If you thought about this perimeter, it has to encapsulate all of your workstations where your employees are spread possibly geographically around the world. It would have to encapsulate all your external applications that are off into the cloud uh, in a hybrid way or a public way. And so the, this wall becomes very nebulous, but when you start thinking about zero trust in this layered approach, how do you build up layers around all of these different spaces so that your security posture is better tomorrow than it is today? So when we started looking at this data, we did the survey with, with BMC. We first asked, do you have a formalized SecOps? So how is security and operations working together hand in hand? And initially when we saw this data, it was, yes, 37% have a formal defined security uh, operations program, which is fantastic. 
but unfortunately, when you sort of peel back, we discovered that 44% of enterprises have no formalized SecOps from the we've got nothing to it's not well defined to we do it on occasion. And when you think about on occasion, that's really the firefighting. That's really, oh my goodness, our hair is on fire. Um, we've got a vulnerability. We could possibly be under attack right now. How do we go and do we fix this problem? And then we get up to the 37% who are defined, which is fantastic. And then we move into the 14% who are at least measured. Um, so building on the defined, now we're at least measuring how well we are doing to the 5% that, that are truly optimized. And that makes a lot of sense. Truly optimized is very difficult to achieve. And so it makes sense in only 5%. But if you are in the 44% of not having a, a defined SecOps program, you are not alone. And I'd mentioned that this perimeter is getting very nebulous because we've got applications going everywhere, and I wanted to touch a little bit on what that looks like today. So when we look at public cloud adoption, for example, it started out in 2014 at 18%, and last year was at 33%. So we've got this great expansion into public cloud adoption, which makes sense. A lot of noise, a lot of benefits going to public cloud, not having to manage the bare metal, being able to release applications quickly. Um, and what we saw initially was this march between, okay, we've got um, internal private cloud, and then they moved off into possibly hosted private or off into public. Now we see this spread from an application could be across all of them, bare metal, uh, internal private, as well as public. So what we're seeing is this spread of a single application in multiple different formats into the cloud. So that perimeter, of course, being extremely nebulous in, in terms of what the application is. And then, of course, they, it may touch back into systems of record that are sitting on bare metal and or internal private cloud. Another thing that's complicating matters is that applications, how they are deployed uh, and built is also fundamentally changing. So with the idea of microservices, and being able to deploy those microservices in containers, you know, developers are extremely excited about this because it allows them uh, basically a, a loosely coupled architecture where they have an, a, a private sandbox where they get to play, they get to put all the pieces they need for their functionality and be very independent and work very independently from other developers. And so it speeds their, their work, which is fantastic. We see it in in development and in testing phases of an application, they're using applications up to 31% of the time, which is great. But then, of course, there's sort of this halting when it gets out into production. It feels very uncomfortable, especially for operations folks who are, are really trying to hold this, you know, we've got applications everywhere, trying to keep it all together, oftentimes with duct tape and chewing gum. Containers feels very uncomfortable because there's no control over what's inside those containers and, and possibly even where they get deployed. And so once it reaches production, only about 10% are in production, but certainly that number we expect to increase dramatically over the next few years as developers really push the, hey, we're super excited about it in development and test and pushing it out into production. So going back to the survey that we did, we said, okay, so what are your most likely initiatives that you're going to implement in the next 12 months? And the top being threat intelligence capabilities, and that makes complete sense. It's very um, nebulous as to what malicious attackers are going to be using next. We know that they are very determined. We know that they employ automated attack mechanisms, and it's hard to really know where they're coming at us next. Now, the top three things they're trying to steal, we know from Forrester data, are, of course, the ever-popular authentication credentials. There's intellectual uh, property, and then personally identifiable data. So those are the top three that attackers are trying to get at as they attack your applications. Um, and so understanding what threats are coming and how they're coming at you is important. Because first of all, you can design better applications, and second of all, you can seal any holes once you discover them. Um, but 
you know, after that, it's complying with security requirements. And I love that it's by business partners, and that's the one that came out. It wasn't necessarily uh, regulatory compliance, which is the fourth on this list, but it was, hey, business partners are tightening the way we want you to deal with the data, which is fantastic. So when you get, for example, a marketing campaign that's directed specifically towards you, something you've searched previously, that touches on average nine different agencies. And it's really ill-defined in terms of uh, regulatory compliance on how that data should be handled between those different businesses. So I was really excited that actually, you know, we've got initiatives to comply with handing off data between our business partners. The next thing is, is security monitoring capabilities, also hand in hand with threat intelligence. How do we know that we are being attacked, uh, that we are under attack, and, and where is it coming from? How can we shut it down? The next one is regulatory compliance, something we see growing in the future. Um, not necessarily from a federal perspective, but if you look to the EU with GDPR, um, that I think will cause other regulations that will spin up. And we're looking at state here in the US, state regulations increasing, especially around applications. How do we make applications more secure? And then the last thing on this list is customer-facing services and applications. How do we really improve for our customer's sake as well as our own sake to make sure that their data is protected? Now going off that last point about how do we secure these external applications, another complicating factor to all of this is of course the fact that developers are embracing speed and moving at speed. So we've got, um, you've got, I've broken it down into three different levels. We've got the bicycle that's pretty much parked on the side of the building where we've got applications releasing, 26% of them releasing half yearly or longer. But then on the flip side, we've got 36% releasing monthly or faster. And so when you start thinking about how do we start protecting applications that have a changing landscape, it becomes very difficult. Now there's the application itself, and then of course there's the stack that it sits on. There's the hardware, whether it be out in the cloud that you've programmed or, or actually on bare metal. You've got your OS, you've got any sort of middleware, you've got configurations on all of that, and any of that could be vulnerable and therefore rolling out the welcome mat to malicious attackers. And that application stack, as well as the application itself, could be changing very quickly. So, you know, monthly or faster, that includes hourly and daily, could be changing. Any piece of that stack could be changing. So that means your security posture, the, what you're putting out there, can be changing very quickly as well. So when we think about, can we throw bodies at this problem? The answer is really, no, we can't. We don't have enough bodies to throw at this. We've got 62% of enterprises reporting not having enough security staff. There's just not enough people, you know, whether it be application security or network security or SecOps folks that can sit and, and watch these threats as they come in. And remember, malicious attackers, once again, determined and they are automated, so these attacks come in brutally quickly. Also, finding the right skills is a challenge. So. You know, do we have the right number of application security people? Do we have the right security folks to fill our SecOps role, to create a defined program, for example? It's very difficult just because there's just not enough resources with that, with that background knowledge. So it was interesting when we asked in our survey, you know, how challenging is it for you? The first thing that came up was lack of staff, which just makes complete sense. Um, the next one was compliance with regulations, and this can be hard because you've got many different applications. Some, for example, will fall under GDPR. Some will fall under PCI, for example. And so understanding which applications are out there and then which regulations they have to comply with can also be very difficult. The next one is very important, which is the day-to-day -day tactical activities. So we've got security people who we know are outnumbered in terms of problems they're facing and then the staffing we can throw at it, but operations is as well. 
So how do we make their lives easier as they're trying to deal with their own tactical day-to-day -day issues? The last one is you know, preventing any violations moving from development. How do we make sure that application stack is secure as it moves into production? So those changes that can be happening very quickly, how do we make sure that that actually decreases the holes we're presenting rather than increasing them? When we ask what solutions you're deploying or planning to deploy, you know, lots of tools, of course. Because there's just not enough bodies to throw at this problem, we need to automate this. And once again, because malicious attackers are using automated attack, really the only way to respond is through an automated response. So the first one is, um, and the way to read this is the dark green is the expanding and upgrading, and then the light green is planning to deploy. So we prioritize this list based on expanding and upgrading, and then of course you get the extra data for expand, or planning to deploy. So the first thing that expanding and upgrading was tools to help identify affected systems. So understanding, first of all, where do we have any holes? Now vulnerabilities get announced, new vulnerabilities get announced every day. And whether that be with open source components that your application may depend on or with OSs, for example, so new vulnerabilities are being announced. How do we know what's actually affected? The next one is, okay, how do we prioritize that, which makes complete sense. Now that we've identified the systems that are affected, how do we effectively prioritize it? The next one I want to go down to is actually the second to the last because it's got the biggest combined expanding, upgrading, and planning to deploy, which is to ensure security and compliance of applications in that DevOps process. So that's really the how do we make sure that we have secured our applications using that DevOps pipeline, releasing very quickly to our advantage where we are complying, where we can seal any holes before it gets out into uh, production. And the next one I'm gonna jump around to is actually the fourth one down, is to put security issues inside of operations work streams. Often when I talk to, to clients, they say, okay, Amy, we've got a problem because we know, what's effect we know we've got this new vulnerability and operations is working, trying to make sure everything is working in the production environment, but how do we bridge the gap between the two? And it's so important to make sure that those vulnerabilities get into operations work streams. Otherwise, it's impossible for them to prioritize based on that day-to-day -day activities that we talked about earlier. How do they balance a newly identified security vulnerability with what they're already trying to do? For example, roll out the, the latest and greatest application. So how do they balance the priorities if they don't understand if they're not in the same work stream? We asked, so you know, we've got that 44% that, that are sitting in that ad hoc, not defined or on occasion. So when we asked everybody, what's the challenges with advancing your SecOps maturity? The first one came up was lack of visibility into unpatched system and the volume left to be patched. So let's just face it, patching is hard. You know, if we were dealing with a single system, that would be easy. That's a well-defined problem. But once again, we're dealing with applications that are spread out across uh, lots of different you know, clouds, internal, bare metal. We've also got workstations for our own employees that we have to secure. So understanding what is not yet patched and the criticality of that is very important. And the, the lack of visibility just prevents us from being able to prioritize it. Is this something that I have to do today or is this something that uh, that can wait. It's maybe attacking, you know, or it may be affecting systems that nobody ever turns on or that does not have uh, any maybe touch points into customers, for example. And then the next one was that security issues are not placed into the operations work stream. Once again, that, that ineffectual handoff between security and operations. And then the last one was uh, the inability to fit changes into maintenance windows. You know, we've we've got patches that require systems to go down. And it just could be that we need to keep them up for customers. So we've only got limited windows where we can bring our systems down, and that can really prevent us from being able to upgrade or patch for security reasons these same systems. 
So we asked, okay, think business level. What advantages are there to improving security operations? And the first thing, of course, was what we expected, fewer security breaches. We would love it if we could improve our security posture, if we were not allowing malicious attackers in, if we could increase our layered approach to security where applications and it's their application stack is actually a barrier to entry, not a welcome mat. The next one was fewer security distractions, that interrupt-driven workflow. Oh my goodness, a new vulnerability has been announced. We have to run around and try to figure out what systems are affected and how to patch them. And then the next ones are things like decreased cost of patching. Of course, it would be great if that were more automated. You know, the handoff was better. It was easier to execute. Efficiency between operations and development teams were next. Once again, making sure that operations understands what development is releasing and be able to patch it before it gets out into customers and malicious attackers' hands. And then the last thing is, is decreased cost of compliance. What applications are affected by what regulations and how do we make sure that they comply? And then the last data point that I'm going to share with you guys, the way to read this one is we actually split it between the folks that identified themselves as having a more mature SecOps organization versus less mature. So the more mature is those folks in green, the dark green, and the less mature are those the one um, who are in the light green. So you'll see some of these big jumps. Um, the first one isn't as big as the second, but the first one is when we said, what benefits have you achieved or do you expect to achieve? The first one was fewer security vulnerabilities, moving from development into operations. And those who are more mature felt like, hey, we are more ready to work that DevOps pipeline, those faster application releases to our advantage to make sure that our vulnerabilities are sealed before they move out to production. The next one, which is a huge gap between more mature and less mature, is that better collaboration. Um, and then the next one that I want to cover is actually the fourth one down, which is the faster remediation, which also has a big gap between more mature and less mature. Uh, once again, the ability to identify we've got a new security vulnerability, hand it off quickly to operations and say, okay, these are the systems that are affected, this is the priority, and this is how we're going to remediate. So some of my key takeaways are now is the time to act. It doesn't matter where you are in your security, your SecOps program, your maturity of your SecOps program. Um, unless you're sitting at that optimized, you're one of the lucky few, now's the time to act. Anything that you can do in this area will improve your security posture. And if you're one of those organizations that faces challenges with staffing or prioritization or effectively complying with regulations, you are not alone. This is a struggle and it's a very difficult problem. But once again, what you can do to automate and help gain visibility of vulnerabilities in those unpatched systems and then effectively remediate them is only going to help alleviate the problems that you had with staffing and prioritization and then complying with those regulations. And then the last thing is, you know, improve, improving SecOps has great benefits. It not only can in, increase your security posture, but that communication between security and operations making swift and fast remediation, effective remediation, especially as malicious attackers are moving in very quickly. And the, our need to seal holes very quickly, especially when new vulnerabilities are identified, happens. So that's my portion. I'm going to hand it off to you, Sean. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think there were some great insights there. I hope everyone else um, um, got, some, got some good actions or takeaways from that. Uh, I will reiterate that those slides are available that you can download, so you have that data that you can look at a little bit more closely on your own time, and we'll also be sending out this webcast again. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about a couple of new solutions that BMC has developed in this, this area. We call them our SecOps solutions. And they're really exciting. I think that we're really uh, going after a couple of key problems that our customers have been pointing out to us. And, and we've delivered two new SaaS solutions to help, help um, address these problems. So let me first talk about one of the, um, the key challenges that 
that a lot of people face. And, and you know, some people, when they think of vulnerabilities, and especially in your your data center, your private clouds, they think about um, you know vulnerabilities that sit in the software in the form of you know some patch that needs to be made. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, I gotta I gotta worry about these zero day exploits and stuff. And the the reality is those really aren't the things that most people um, should be worrying about. It's really those vulnerabilities that have been in existence for a while. In fact, um, there there's some data out there that says uh, you know less than one percent of exploits are coming on on zero day uh, attacks. So what is really important to think about is what is the the risk posture of my environment? Where are all the vulnerabilities? And then how do I prioritize and take care of those vulnerabilities? So let me look at, at it from a different perspective. So we have have done some you know some data uh, mining on the web, and one of the things we've noticed is that half of all exploitations happen between day 10 and 100. That means there's really not anything to, to too much happening between um, zero and 10. The average time it takes for a company to patch is about 193 days. That means that that these exploit exploits are happening well after a patch has been made available, but well before the company has gotten around to, to actually filling out the patch, you know, to, to applying patches. And there's lots of reasons for that. As Amy said, patching is hard. You know, you have to, um, you know, plan for it uh, maintenance windows, and you have to identify the, the right patch to go against the right level of operating system, and you have to automate the collections of groups and deploy all that. So it's, there's a lot that's involved in patching that can be, you know, fairly difficult, but, um, but, but it still seems to be one of the big challenges. If you look at it from another perspective, you'll see that most of the vulnerabilities, the top 10 vulnerabilities, um, or I should say the top 10 exploits are happening through just 10 vulnerabilities. So if you really focused on just the right vulnerabilities, then all of a sudden you really start to reduce your, your attack surface very quickly by patching the most, um, the most uh, exploitable vulnerabilities. But you can't stop there. Even though you've 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 hit 85% of it, the other 15% of, of vulnerabilities or attacks actually are targeting over 900 CVEs. So there's really a lot of other places that that those vulnerabilities are coming in. And in fact, if you look at uh, WannaCry, which was pretty heavily documented, um, the WannaCry vulnerability, the patch was made available, and then it was about seven times from um, it was about seven days, actually, from the, the time that the vulnerability was announced to the time that the patch was made available. But it was another 59 days before that uh, vulnerability was actually started to um, get attacked by the WannaCry virus. So that just means that, that companies had, on average, about 52 days there that they could have taken that patch and, and applied it to their systems and you know, stopped this vulnerability from happening. But they didn't because of the things that we've mentioned already. It's difficult, you know, to, to get patches applied everywhere. There are certain systems that that are, um, you know, critical, and you have to fit them into tight maintenance windows. Those are kinds of things that a lot of people just don't have the visibility to, and, and that's one of the things that we're trying to solve with with the solution that we're calling SecOps Response Service. So this is a new solution, and one of the things that we're doing immediately is giving that visibility. So a lot of organizations have vulnerability scanners, something like a Qualys or a Nessus or a Rapid7 that are picking up that data uh, on the scan systems and then they're pulling, pulling it in, they're preparing spreadsheets. This is generally done in the security operations team and then they're handing it over to the IT operations team and saying, here's where all the, great, here's where all the vulnerabilities are, fix them. But the IT operations team has lots of other priorities that they have to manage, right? So they have performance and availability things that they're trying to handle. They're trying to update configurations for the application team to update infrastructure. And they're trying to work down their patches. And so they have this long list that they have to somehow prioritize and somehow uh, assign to the right um, people within the organization and decide which ones to patch first. What SecOps Response Service does is it takes all that information, integrates it directly from those scanners, and puts it into a nice graphical way to be able to understand where are my vulnerabilities across my environment, and then 
how do I um, you know, create a plan that will allow me to work down that vulnerability backlog? You're never going to be able to work them all down, but you can certainly have an, a plan that attacks the most critical vulnerabilities first. The other thing that we do is we also integrate with another one of our BMC tools called BMC Discovery, which does a really good job of, of crawling through the network and finding things that perhaps your vulnerability scanner didn't pick up. We call these blind spots. So these are systems that were never scanned, but ver could very well have vulnerabilities on them. And what that tells you is you need to go apply your vulnerability scanner to those assets as well. So we help give that, that blind spot visibility so that you can take those assets that have not, or those resources that are out there that have not been scanned, add a scanning um, tool to it, and then pull those resources in and start to scan. Now once you've got those, those scanned resources in the BMC response service tool, you have visibility from two perspectives. One from the operational perspective, the IT operations team can look at it and say, okay, where are my vulnerabilities? What do I need to work down? How am I doing against my service level agreements that say I have to have my sub five taken care of and patched within, let's say, 10 days, and my sub fours have to be within 20 days? How am I doing against those service level agreements? The operation or the security team can also look at it from their view and say, okay, what is the operations team doing with all these vulnerabilities that I gave them on a spreadsheet? They got a graphical interface. They can see exactly how all those vulnerabilities are taken care of. And if something big like WannaCry starts to pop up and, and all of a sudden they're saying, hey, this is the most important thing we've got to get taken care of, the operations team can quickly pivot and you know, filter on those uh, want to cry vulnerabilities and reprioritize and get those things taken care of much faster. So it really helps you, you know, detect where all your blind spots are, build a remediation plan, prioritize it, and fit it into those maintenance windows to take care of, of all that. And then it's executed, the remediations are actually executed through a server automation tool, something like uh, BladeLogic server automation, or, or even uh, Microsoft System Center Configuration Manager. So a great tool. Lots of, um, lots of our customers are, are really getting excited about it and, and starting to, to purchase it and deploy it, and we're seeing lots of, of great results. So the next um, area of, of challenge that I'll talk about is, is in the public cloud. So when, when you think about a public cloud, you have lots of services. I was just at AWS reInvent last week, and I mean, they are just launching new services left and right. I mean, they, they have talked about, um, depending on how you talk about it, you know, over 100 services that they, that they offer. But there's also, when they talk about them in terms of features, around 5,000 features that can be used to help you know, configure and set up and, and manage your, your cloud infrastructure. Now, some of those things are on EC2. So you're deploying uh, an image that might have an agent on it, and you can actually control the operating system. But some of those things are just services. They're just SaaS or PaaS services, like uh, your storage in S3, or your Elasticsearch, or your uh, Cloud Trail monitoring service. And those, there's nothing to patch. If there's a vulnerability, you don't patch it. So how do you secure those things? You secure them through configuration. You have to configure them properly in a way that isn't going to expose your organization to some risk. So a lot of the exposures that you've heard about in terms of voter records being exposed were the result of not configuring um, an S3 bucket or not configuring an Elasticsearch um, resource in a way that, that, that made it secure. And so this is you know, obviously a, a huge risk if you're deploying more and more of your infrastructure out into public cloud resources and all of a sudden, you know, the scale is starting to get beyond where you, you can handle. As Amy talked about, there is a cybersecurity skills shortage out there. Most organizations think that they don't have enough cybersecurity skills. So as you start to deploy more and more into the public cloud, now all of a sudden this challenge of knowing how to configure these security configurations and being able to do it as you're scaling up and adding more and, and frequently changing these services becomes a bigger issue because you don't have the people that can actually scale with you. Um, and the risk, the, the impact of not doing something is the potential data breach. Now the data breach uh, data that we see here, $4 million, the cost of a data breach, this is a stat from the Ponemon Institute. 
which when you break it down is, is roughly $150 per, um, per data record that, that was breached. You can expand that to however many data records might be in your environment and you can kind of get an estimate of, of what the cost of a data breach could be if it hits your organization. So obviously there's a lot of cost involved there, uh, a lot of risk I should say. So the solution that we have here is called SecOps Policy Service. Now Policy Service will look at those configurations, especially those as, you know, as you're deploying out on AWS or Azure, and it will, um, you assign policies to the different things. So for instance, you're, you might have policies around how you're setting up your, your storage or how you're setting up your Elasticsearch or your identity and access management credentials. All of those things may have some policy. I don't want my, 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 my storage to be um, publicly facing, for instance. I want to make sure that the password lengths are properly set. I want to make sure that the, um, the uh, roles are properly set. And what policy service will do is monitor those things as they're being deployed and then on a frequent basis to make sure that when any changes happen, you're quickly notified and how that might impact your, your overall risk posture in the cloud. And so these two tools can work hand in glove together. You have one that's response service, which is working on those, you know, the application, especially the operating systems that you control, whether they're in your own environment or whether they're in a, a um, infrastructure as a service cloud environment where you control the OS, as well as the services that those things might be accessing, things like the AWS services or the Azure services. So this really helps to identify all those things. Now, one last feature that this, this policy service does is because um, it allows you to really check about any kind of policy, and, and, and those things can be aligned with you know, various different um, <clears throat> uh, regulatory rules or compliance. It also allows you to check, um, you know, to run it in your DevOps pipeline. So you could be doing checks within your DevOps pipeline as you're building out your application code to check not only what are the configurations in my, in my AWS dev environment, for instance, but also you know, running security scans on your application and, and on your web servers and, and making sure that those things don't have vulnerabilities that you're then releasing out into production. So doing those scans, checking them and making sure that the, the vulnerabilities are something that you're, you're either willing to live with or something that you want to fix before you move on. So these are two great new solutions from, from BMC. We have, um, you know, we have lots of, of additional resources out on the web under these things. So we've got videos and, and white papers so you can get more understanding of how they work. And we've got a free trial on SecOps Policy Service that we just launched in the last few days that allows you to get a quick uh, you know, feel for how the software works. So with that, I'm going to um, say thank you. We're going to move into the question phase. We have a couple of questions. Um, as a reminder, you can enter questions down into the chat room. And so, um, <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to start. I have one that came in, and this question was about the, the data. So Amy, I don't know if you have a breakdown of the, the data in terms of you know, what the maturity of the SecOps customers were if you divide it down by size of enterprise. You know what, I'm going to be opening the report in the background so that I can answer that question. Would you answer another okay. one and, and I'll do you the bet. research. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, the next question is, we host on AWS. I understand that they do automatic patching from my application, MySQL. Is BMC's different or better than AWS? Um, so I guess it, it's, it's a little different and um, better, uh, better in different ways. So, um, so if you're thinking of, of database as a service, so what we would do is help you understand whether it was configured properly, and then if those configurations are changing, we would flag those and let you know that, hey, um, a configuration has changed, you may or may not want to go change that because it, it has created a, a vulnerability. Now the way that we have created these, these um, I'll call them best practices for configurations is we've gone out and we've looked at what the Center for Internet Security has set up as benchmarks for how you can secure your AWS infrastructure. And we've built those into policies that can then be applied against resources. Um, if you're talking about 
uh, MySQL running on an Amazon instance in, in, in an IaaS in, environment, then it's a similar type approach essentially is you would scan that, you would identify where the vulnerability is, and then you would um, um, you know, decide how to patch that. And we could patch that with um, response conduct, uh, you know, controlling uh, a blade logic server automation endpoint to, to actually do that patching. I'm ready. Okay, Amy is going to take on the question of, <laughs> of uh, how it varies by enterprise. <laughs> yeah, so um, you know, all of these by Forrester's definition are enterprise, but depending on, on the person answering or asking the question, what your definition of enterprise is, I'll break it down for you. So 49% came from 1,000 to 4,999 employees, so that's almost half. Uh, 25%, so a quarter came from company size uh, of 5,000 to 19,999 employees. And 26% came from 20,000 employees or more. Now, is there any, um, any uh, whether, it, whether it's from the data or just from your own experience, any insights in terms of whether large organizations are more mature or less mature than, than smaller organizations? You know, it really varies. Um, you know, we see a lot of larger organizations who have very security-minded leaders, especially in IT, that have great SecOps. And then we've got smaller companies that have great SecOps, almost because it's easier. There's not as many layers or barriers between operations and security um, because they're just a smaller company. And so it's easier for them to do the work between those two organizations. But it actually varies. There's not a clear larger companies are better because they're more likely to be breached or anything like that. OK, no, that's, that's, that's great. Um, so another question, Amy, and I think I'll let you answer this one. It says, um, how can SecOps be successful in an organization without senior management commitment to a formal security program? That one's hard. Um, so even when we talk about DevOps, we say one of the keys to DevOps is higher level support. You need a sponsor. You know, you may be able to get a little bit with grassroots where you've, you know, you've hooked development and operations together and even included security um, so you can land, but it's hard to expand without senior management. Um, so I would suggest landing. Um, find spots where there's good coordination and grassroots between operations and security, how you get the identification of unpatched systems, for example, and then the automation of the patching itself, how, and the prioritization. How can you get that to work, the tools to work, show some success, and then show it to layers up. Hey, listen, we did this grassroots. Um, thing where we paired the you know security and operations and even development together and look at all these great things we were able to do. We were able to improve remediation time, for example, and prioritization, and the communication is increased. So if you're able to at least land and then promote up, then hopefully you're able to gain yourself a sponsor, and then that person can help you expand. Okay. Yeah. No. That's that's good insight. Um, so another question, does BMC solution support or utilize uh, CASB 2.0? Um, we, we, we do not, um, we, we haven't, haven't prioritized that as something we do support. Um, I, I will say that, you know, in terms of the, um, so, so the tool that's most applicable to uh, CASB, which is a Cloud Access Security Broker, is Policy Service. And we've written the, um, the program to allow really the creation of any kind of rule that you want. Um, we use it in a simple YAML language, and we have lots of example um, policies that we include with the product. And then we have a community that allows us to create more and, and you know, save them and publish them and reutilize different kinds of, of policy. So, I mean, certainly those things could be constructed, and it's something that um, I guess if we get, you know, more requests for, we'll, 
we'll work on on prioritizing that. But that that's hasn't that's the first time we've actually heard CASB 2.0 as a as a request. Um, I, I have um, one more uh, question I wanted to ask here, and so this is um, this is for you, Amy. It says, knowing that release speeds are increasing, is there anything a company can do pre-release to help with SecOps? Absolutely. So if you're talking about high speeds, you're usually talking about a DevOps organization, and they have automated things like infrastructure as code. And that gives you lots of benefits because it will create a bill of materials, and that helps with the identification of what you have in there, what OS is, what middleware. And so then that can help with the whole prioritization, identification, and then pushing that DevOps pipeline to quickly release patches. So yes, there's lots you can do ahead of time, like I said, with that bill of materials, and then using DevOps as going on the offense rather than on the defense to truly create remediation quickly. Okay, that's that's great. That's great advice. Well, um, I think that's that's about it. I really want to thank Amy for some great insights and um, a great presentation. And uh, a reminder that we do have an email that will come out to you with links to the deck as well as a, um, um, a link to the playback. And then there's additional resources on the BMC software webpage that you can find under bmc.com/secops. So. With that, I'll close the call and thank you.